Good morning, everybody. I'm just going to give it a few more minutes. I don't hear anything. All right, good morning. <laughs> Do you hear that? <laughs> Let's see, I'll give it about one more minute. You hear me too, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and go first thing. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to the Big Gardens Intermediate Vegetable Production. All right. So I am Brittany Beyer. I am the Gardens and Giving Grove Manager based out of Omaha and surrounding Nebraska area. I'm Molly Barain. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm the Gans Kansas Giving Grove and Community Garden Program Manager. So, first, we will be talking about how to choose a garden site. Uh, it's important to pay attention to the lighting. You're going to want to choose a sunny spot, so pay attention to the pattern of sunlight at different hours of the day. Most vegetables do best in full sun over eight hours of direct sunlight per day. Keep in mind, trees, fence lines, buildings, etc. They could cause shade in the afternoons. Watering is also uh, something we will want to consider. Uh, water access must be within 200 feet of garden space. Most vegetable crops grow best if they receive about an inch of rainfall per week throughout the growing season. Great. So your layout and terrain. You want to avoid low-lying areas. Avoid putting a vegetable garden in a spot where the water pools after a rainstorm. Consider the convenience of the garden. A little easier when it's closer to your house than further away. Raised bed gardens use elevated frames that define a small and manageable space for the garden. In-ground gardens work well when the soil is suitable for a garden. They are less expensive to get started and are easily moved to another location if needed. Garden rows resemble long, low hills of soil and straight rows and are far forms when you till your soil and add mulch, compost, or straw. A vegetable garden needs to be level. The necessary even distribution of water, soil, nutrients, and sunlight is important. Your garden orientation. You are going to want a south-facing slope 
You want to run your beds north to south to maximize light and air circulation. Beds that orient east and west tend to get too shaded. Your bed width is about 30 inches to 48 inches wide. Your pathway width, you want about 12 inches to 36 inches wide. If you are mainly using your paths for walking, it makes sense to have about 12 inches. But if you're going to be pushing wheelbarrows and stuff through, you're going to want to give yourself more space. Okay, so you're going to want to mound your beds to increase soil temperature and promote good drainage. Uh, considering slopes, orient your beds in the opposite direction of the slope to prevent erosion and trap water runoff. Okay, so raised bed construction. Raised beds are gen generally three to four feet wide by six, eight, or 12 feet long. They're about six to 18 inches in height. And materials you use to build beds are wood, metal, and concrete. As you can see in some of our pictures here, some really pretty examples of the concrete and wood and then the metal. All right, so garden tools. Uh, some tools you wanna to focus on when starting your garden are a spade. A spade is used for digging straight edged holes, slicing and lifting sod, and edging flowers, beds, or lawns trowel or hand tool used for breaking up earth and digging small holes, especially for planting and weeding. A hoe used for turning over the soil and removing weeds can also be used for creating lines in garden rows. Your sprayer is used for applying herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers. Tiller broad fork uh, used for turning, tilling, lifting, and aerating soil your cultivator used for removing weeds in a certain area. Great, so your soil composition. These are just some of the ingredients that our soil is made up of. They are important when testing your soil. Um, sand, sand particles are large with lots of space between each grain. Water and nutrients flow through easily, but aren't retained. Sandy soil doesn't bind together well, and sand is good for oxygen infiltration. Clay. Clay particles are very small and close together. Clay is dense and sticky. It holds water well, but like I said, it is dense. When clay dries out, it becomes hard and difficult to till. Many plants struggle in clay because of its poor drainage and dense nature. Silt. Silt particles are larger than clay, but smaller than sand. Silt is like clay in that it retains moisture, but doesn't allow much oxygen flow. Silt deposits can be very fertile and support lots of plant growth. Loam is probably one of the preferred. Um, so it's often referred as a topsoil or black dirt. It's a mixture of sand, clay, and silt. The estimated mixture is 40% sand, 40% silt, and 20% clay. Loam is just the right mixture of all three that it holds nutrients well, retains water, but still drains properly and allows oxygen to infiltrate. Great. <laughs> soil testing. It's recommended to test your soil pH and nutrients status every three to five years. Vegetable, vegetable crops grow best in soils with a pH of 6.5 to 7.5. Uh, home test kits are available at gardening centers. They're not always 100% accurate or thorough, so I do recommend professional testing through your local county extension office. Uh, the soil nutrients. Three main nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. 
Other important nutrients are calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Nitrogen helps with growth. It is also necessary with a part of chlorophyll, which makes the leaves green and helps plants photosynthesize. Phosphorus. It is needed for developing flowers, fruits, and root systems. Potassium keeps roots healthy and helps with flowering and fruiting. It also helps plants tolerate stress, such as drought. Ways to improve your soil. You're gonna to wanna to work or till in four to five inches of organic material like compost. You wanna grow cover, crop, cover crops in the off season. Mulch around your plants, shrubs, and trees with organic material like hay, straw, bark, leaves, or wood chips. Each year, you're gonna to wanna to add a minimum of two more inches of organic material to your soil. All right, so here is a diagram that shows the breakdown of some of the nutrients that are in our soil. The perfect amount is between 6.0 and 7.5. As you can see in the green, this is where we get most of our nutrients. When we start going lower than 6.0, that's when our um, soil starts to get a little more acidic. And then above a 7.5 is when it starts to have a little more alkaline. So we want a healthy balance in the middle, 6.0 to a 7.5. All right, so preparing your site. You want to consider the grading and the drainage of your yard. Grading involves adding or removing soil to redirect the flow of water away from your home or garden. The best way to do this is to create a slope. If your yard has a natural slope, you may just need to adjust it in order to create better drainage. If not, then you may need to add soil in certain areas and use retaining walls to hold back excess water. The general rule of thumb is that your land should have a 2% slope away from your home or garden. Poor drainage can lead to a variety of problems such as standing water in the yard and soil erosion. You can use a laser level, long straight edge, or a garden hose to help visualize where water is flowing when it rains. Some ways to prevent. Installing a drain system can help improve your yard drainage. Drains can be buried underground or installed around flower beds. Succulents, ferns, and native plants are good choices for low maintenance and effective yard drainage. You can also install a catch basin if you're dealing with heavy runoff, water pooling in specific areas of your yard or significant flooding, it's best to contact a landscape specialist or a contractor. All right, so tilling. Uh, we are going to use a tiller to help prepare our garden beds. So it is the act of turning over the soil before planting. It can be done by hand if you have a small garden area or you, by using a broad fork or tiller. Most vegetable patches and large gardens will require the use of a mechanical tiller. In a tilled garden, the soil is cultivated to a depth of about 8 to 10 inches. Do not overtill your garden. Tilling with a tiller over long periods of time can cause soil compaction, so the roots of vegetables and plants will not be able to poke through. We'll also add more weeds due to the lifting of the soil and bringing up more weed seeds. I would start your garden using a tiller, but from the point after that, from then on, I would start using a broad fork. So removing the weeds. You can pull the weeds from its base, which is close to the soil line, and twist gently to dislodge the roots. You may have to dig into the ground if a larger root system. Pulling weeds helps plants gain the nutrients they need back. Only water vegetables with drip irrigation. That uh, helps reduce uh, weed pressure. Also, uh, solarization is an option when wanting to help get remo um, remove weeds. 
Uh, it's a process of placing a clear plastic tarp over a field garden bed or lawn to heat up the soil underneath. The intention of solarization is to kill weeds or grass. And it can have added benefits of reducing pathogen populations in the soil. All right, so mulch. <clears throat> Pros of mulch are they reduce weed growth by keeping light from reaching the soil surface, reduces water loss from the soil surface, which helps maintain soil moisture, moderates soil temperatures, keeping it warmer on cold nights and cooler on hot days. It protects bare soil, reducing erosion and soil compaction, protects plants from the harsh conditions of winter freezes, thaws, and winds. Some cons, too much mulch can bury and suffocate plants. Water and oxygen also have a harder time reaching the roots. Mulch near plant stems is the perfect place for snails, tunneling rodents, and more pests to reside. Mulch can bake your plants with excess heat in midsummer if not done properly. Light colored wood based mulches like sawdust or fresh wood chips can steal nitrogen from the soil as they break down. That also that nitrogen will be released once wood chips are broken down. Uh, different types, you have your organic mulches, which include living materials such as chopped leaves, straw, grass clippings, wood chips, compost, shredded bark, sawdust, pine needles, and even shredded paper. Your inorganic mulches include black plastic and geotextiles like man-made fabric. All right, so just a quick reminder of our plant hardiness zone map. So Nebraska is a zone 5B, Upper Kansas is a zone 6A, and Lower Kansas is a zone 7. All right, so first and last freeze free dates. Upper Kansas, your first freeze free date is May 15th. Your last freeze free date is October 15th. Lower Kansas, your first freeze free date is April 15th, and your last freeze free date is October 30th. Nebraska, our first freeze free date is May 30th and our last freeze free date is October 1st. Um, you probably have noticed that the dates are starting to shift some since our zones are slowly moving north. All right, so planting schedule. Uh, on the right is a diagram of an example of a planting schedule. Uh, examples of some vegetable herbs and flower seeds for direct sowing. Uh, corn, lettuce, and other greens, melons, okra, peas, radishes, spinach, turnips, columbine, dill, marigold, morning glory, poppy, and sunflower. So this diagram, you can see uh, which seeds to start indoors. A lot of them start around March. And then through April through September is about where you would either plant your seed or transplant the ones you've started to where they can grow through their season. And then you have most dates on the October, or just in red, are when you harvest dates. Great, so some cool weather crops. Uh, artichokes, arugula, beets, asparagus, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, carrots, celery, fennel, garlic, kale, lettuce, onion, onion green bunching, peas, potato, radish, spinach, turnips. So some of these, like your leafy greens, arugula, your chard, kale, uh, spinach, your peas, radish, turnips, those could all be started by seed, lettuce as well. Uh, ones to start with transplanting could be broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, collards, cilantro, 
Uh, potatoes, you will start with a potato slip. Uh, you have onion bulbs, but you also have some onions like the green bunching that can be started with seed. Seed beets can be started by seed as well. Great, so here's like an idea of the outdoor planting schedule. So it's very early to early spring. Um, this shows the breakdown of some vegetables that we either, the T is for transplanting and the S is for starting seeds. So you can see a lot of those start early April. And then your H is your harvest. So you see your broccoli, we want to start early April and around May is when you'll start harvesting. Uh, you see uh, there are different kinds of lettuce that can either be transplanted or started by seed as well. So this is just an example. Let's just take a look at it for a second. All right, so your warm weather crops, you have corn, beans, summer squash, winter squash, basil, cucumber, eggplant, okra, pepper, sweet potato, and tomato. And let's see, you have your corn, your beans, your summer squash and winter squash, um, cucumbers, can all be started by direct seeding, or you can also transplant cucumbers, your basil, your squash can be transplanted as well. Okra, I would start by seed, peppers, tomatoes. Um, well, tomatoes are something you could start by seed, but also transplant. And sweet potato, you'll start with your sweet potato slips. And here is another outdoor planting schedule that shows your last spring frost. Um, See your beans, starting them by seed around April 15th, and you can start harvesting in May. Same with your cucumbers, seed, pumpkin squash, watermelon seed, you transplant eggplant, peppers, tomatoes. So just taking a moment. Okay, thank you so much, Brittany. Um, again, I'm Molly, and I'm going to do the second half of the presentation. Um, and I'm going to talk about common plant diseases for vegetables. So first to understand plant diseases, we need to know that it's an interaction between the host, the pathogen, and the environment. If any one of those uh, changes in terms of if the host is resistant to a certain pathogen or if the environment is not favorable, um, that triangle of interaction would be disrupted. Okay, next. So with plant diseases, we have abiotic and biotic diseases. So biotic is living, abiotic is non-living. So biotic includes fungi, bacteria, viruses, and nematodes. An abiotic would be a pH soil imbalance, which Brittany had talked about earlier, how a pH is really important to, um, to track because if you have an imbalance of your pH that can cause diseases. Um, chemical burns, for example, if there's a field nearby and they sprayed 2,4-D, um, that can cause damage to your vegetables if, um, if you're downwind of that. Gurdaline, as you can see in this picture on the far right, what's happened here is twine has wrapped around the base of the tree trunk and it's girdled, which essentially means it's like suffocated it. And that if it goes all the way around, it can kill your tree. And then extreme temperatures and moisture as well can affect the quality and the um, life of your tree or plant or vegetable. Okay. 
disease management. So what are some things that we can do to kind of keep our disease pressure under control? One would be to choose disease resistant varieties. Um, as you can see in the market every year, there's new um, different cultivars of fruits and vegetables that are resistant to very common diseases. Crop rotation is really beneficial for soil borne diseases. And crop rotation is essentially the management of your vegetable garden where you're rotating your crops one bed over every growing season. So um, I suggest designing your vegetable beds out on a piece of paper and however you choose to design your garden, if you have like a row, um, label what each row, what's planted in each row. So if you have a row of tomatoes and a row of beans and a row of corn, for example, then the next year when you're planting your garden, you want to rotate each bed one row over. So if your tomatoes is in row one, um, next year you would plant your tomatoes in row two, and then the next year row three and so on. And also you need to keep in mind plant families. So for example, tomatoes and eggplant are both in the Solanaceae family, which means they also have very similar diseases. They affect um, both of them very similarly if they're in the same plant family. So I don't suggest planting tomatoes one year and then eggplant in that same bed the following year because that essentially you're not getting the benefit of rotating your crops because they will have similar plant um, effects. So choose different plant families when you're rotating your crops. So I would say uh, maybe one year plant your tomatoes in that bed and then next year corn. So those are two different types, two different plant families. So that's uh, one management system that is really effective. Also proper sanitation. If you have any diseased fruits or leaves, make sure you're removing those from your garden and do not put those in your compost bin. Um, you want to keep that disease out of your garden as much as possible. So you would just uh, toss those in the trash. Don't put them in your compost bin. Also plant biodiversity. If you have a diverse vegetables, flowers, fruits, herbs, you're gonna have less disease issues because you're, that biodiversity helps kind of keep those in check. Um, plant vigorous, healthy plants. Um, choose a suitable site. So if you have a site that has good drainage, good um, air circulation, all those types of things, then that will reduce your disease pressure as well as good light and water. Okay, next. So common plant diseases by vegetable. Um, I'm not gonna read these all out. I will let you kind of skim this over, but some common diseases for tomatoes, for example, early blight, blossom end rot, and then with cucumbers, we have the mildews and bacterial wilt. Squash gets the mildews, bacterial wilt. Melons get a lot of mildew, anthracnose. Corn, um, they get corn smut, rust, fusarium wilt. Apples, they get cedar apple rust, fire blight, apple scab. Strawberries, very common for uh, them to get botrytis, which is also called gray mold and powdery mildew. And then with peaches, very common to get peach leaf curl and brown rot. Okay, next. Some common vegetable pests. Um, you will most likely see these in your garden at some point. Um, beetles, caterpillars, aphids, spider mites, borers, white flies, thrips, bagworms, grasshoppers, and stink bugs. Okay, next. So common pests by vegetable. Again, um, I have I like to break it down by the vegetables so you kind of know what to look for. So with tomatoes, very common pest is the tomato hornworm, also called the tobacco hornworm, and the tomato fruit worm. With peppers, they often get spider mites and aphids, as well as Japanese beetles, eggplants. Um, it's very common to get flea beetles pretty much every single year. I have grown eggplants. I've had some level of flea beetle damage as well as aphids. Um, cucumbers, they will get the cucumber beetle and the cutworm. With corn, corn earworm and the fall armyworm are very common. 
with squash is the squash vine bore, which is they bore into the uh, the like the the stem of the squash and it plugs them up and it kills them. And then squash bugs and then cabbage, cabbage looper, cabbage worm with potatoes. Common is the Colorado potato beetle and the potato leaf hopper. With apples, it's coddling moth, oriental fruit moth, and apple maggot. And with peaches, it's the greater peach tree borer, the plum cucurlio, and as well as Japanese beetles. Okay, next. So to manage insects in your vegetable garden, there's a, a process called IPM, which is called, which is integrated pest management. And that's a, a management style where you're choosing the least invasive uh, method down to, to the most aggressive. So first start with hand picking or spraying with water. If you don't have a bat infestation, a lot of times you can just hand pick the pests off your tree, off your uh, fruit tree or something like that. And, or with aphids, you can also just spray them with a heavy stream of water. Um, you can also put out sticky traps or hormone traps for like Japanese beetles, for example. You can um, trap those with hormone traps. Um, using floating roll covers. So any kind of like physical barrier over your vegetables is really effective. The only caveat with that is that you need to remove those row covers during pollination time. So when the flowers are open, you wanna make sure that those flowers are being pollinated. Otherwise you're not gonna get any um, vegetables. You're not gonna get any cucumbers and um, squash and things like that. So you need to remove your row cover during pollination time. And then after that point, once you see them starting to develop, then you put the row cover back on and that can act like a physical barrier against a lot of your pests. That's really effective for many of them. Um, with the next kind of control method would be horticultural oil or insecticidal soap. And those are really great against aphids, spider mites, thrips, mealybugs, for example, or white flies. And then you can use BT, which is also, that's a short for Bacillus thuringiensis which is a very safe product. Um, if you ingest it, it, it will not be toxic to you or if like your pets, your, your dog, if they ingested it, it would not be toxic. Now, if you want it in the powder form, that's called Dipel, or if you want it in the pre-mixed bottle that you can buy at like a, like at a big box store, that's called Thuricide. And then the more aggressive approach if the, are the last two, spinosad and pyrethrins. Those are probably the most toxic um, of the organic pesticides that we would recommend. Um, they're broad spectrum, which means that they kill a lot of different types of insects, which can include bees. So you wanna make sure that you're not spraying spinosad or pyrethrins when your leaves are wet. Or if you see a lot of uh, bees, like in the, early morning, like 6 a.m. At, at dawn, when they're really active, you don't wanna be spraying at that time because it can affect your bees. But it is, it is really effective. So spinosad can kill caterpillars, thrips, leaf miners, spider mites, and pyrethrins, which is a compound from chrysanthemum flowers that will affect crawling and flying insects. So like aphids, leaf hoppers, your cabbage loopers on your cabbage plants, flea beetles, things like that. So you go from the least invasive, like hand picking, to more heavy duty uh, treatments such as spinosad and pyrethrins. Okay, next. And each gardener kind of has their own uh, system of the way they like to manage the vegetable garden. You can go the organic route or you can go the inorganic route. So kind of the pros and cons of those is organic, you're not using any synthetic pesticides. One disadvantage is that it may cost, or sorry, one advantage is that it may cost less, but a disadvantage is that you might have some blemishes on your fruits and vegetables. Um, it does require a bit more management and time for the gardener, but it, it can be safer for the environment and for your pollinators and for yourself, if it's used correctly. 
Now, inorganic management may cost a bit more because you have to buy all those products um, and you're using synthetic pesticides. But one advantage is that you tend to have better quality control because they are um, really effective. But um, one disadvantage is that it can be harmful to the environment and to wildlife. But it is easier to remedy a lot of crop problems if you use the inorganic method. But if you really uh, wanna be aware of your environment and also your health, um, I would say try to go the more organic route. Okay, next. So next thing I'm gonna talk about composting. Any good gardener or even beginner gardeners, I think should dive headfirst into composting. And the reason why is it improves soil compaction and your soil composition and improves the organic matter. Um, you're adding nutrients back into your soil. You're recycling your natural resources and it's free. And if you're not familiar with what composting is, it's just a method of speeding up natural decomposition of plant materials under controlled conditions. Okay, next. So key components to, to a compost pile, um, that's nitrogen, carbon, water, oxygen, macroorganisms, and microorganisms. Next. So good sources of nitrogen for your compost pile is anything green. So that includes fresh grass clippings, any green leaf matter, any weeds that you've pulled out of the garden, essentially anything that's green. Uh, fruit and vegetable scraps from your kitchen, that's awesome to add to your vegetable pile, but make sure that when you add those, you're covering them back up with some, maybe some grass clippings or some leaves, because it will help break it down quicker. You can add coffee grounds, also um, eggshells. You can add eggshells, just make sure you crush them up kind of fine before you add them to your pile. And then manure. Chicken has the highest ratio of nitrogen. Um, one food safety tip is that we don't recommend adding fresh manure to your vegetable garden because that can be dangerous to your health. So it's better to add any fresh manure. So like if you have chickens, for example, um, it's better to add that to your compost pile and help it break down a little bit in, in your compost and then add that once it's broken back down add that to your vegetable garden and you'll be a lot less likely to get sick from that. Okay, next. All right, sources of carbon for your compost pile include brown materials such as dried leaves, hay, straw, wood chips or other woody debris like sticks, cardboard or newspaper. Next. Your micro and macroorganisms. So macroorganisms include earthworms, beetles, centipedes. Your microorganisms are bacteria, fungi, and microbes. Now, all these already exist in your environment. So most likely if you build it, they will come. You don't necessarily have to add these. Now, if you're living in an environment where the soil is fairly sterile and you don't see a lot of earthworms. Um, you can add effective microorganisms, also called EMs, or fungal inoculates to help kind of accelerate the decomposition. But most of the time, that's not necessary. You can just build the pile, and those those things will already be there in the environment, helping you help break it down. Okay, next. So other ingredients um, that you can add to your pile are wood ash that can help increase your pH. So if your pH is really low, it can help kind of adjust your pH and add calcium and phosphorus. Um, a product called First Saturday Lime can help with the smell. It's just a powder. Um, you can add bone meal or blood meal. So blood meal would be nitrogen and bone meal would be phosphorus. You can add some native soil. The native soil will have microorganisms, perhaps worms, things like that. If you add some of that to your pile, that will also kind of help inoculate your compost pile. And then larger organisms will probably make a home in your compost pile. Many times I have found a snake <laughs> in my pile, but you can get frogs, lizards, all kinds of fun creatures in there. Okay, next. So this is how you design your pile. Um, you want to do it in layers. 
and your ratio should be three to one carbon to nitrogen. So you want three parts carbon, which is your brown materials, remember, and your one part nitrogen, which is your green materials. So and like I said, you want to build it kind of a layer of brown, a layer of green, then a layer of brown, and then you could do also a layer of soil, like native soil, a layer of brown, a layer of green soil, layer of brown, and you want to do it in layers. And the reason why is because that's the quickest way to get it to decompose is if you do it in layers like that. Um, the optimum temperature for your compost pile is between 135 and 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I would try to stay within that range. You don't want it to get hotter than 160 degrees um, because at that point, um, it's not really helping your compost pile. And actually I have seen compost piles catch fire because they're so hot. <laughs> um, but you don't want to get below 135 because then they're not going to be decomposing as quickly. And also that nice temperature of 135 to 136 is when you kill weed seeds and any pathogens that might be in the soil, it will help kill it at that temperature. And there are uh, out there, you can see like these probes with a, um, almost like a meat thermometer, but like it's really long and you, you can put that in the center of your compost pile and you can monitor the temperature in the center because the center of your pile is gonna be the hottest part and that's where it's gonna be breaking down the fastest. So that helps you monitor the temperature. And in the beginning, the P, oop, one back, yeah. In the beginning, your pH will be very low, um, around four to 4.5. But by the time the compost pile has decomposed, it'll be a pH of about seven to 7.2, which is ideal for your, for your garden. Okay, you can go next. So the decomposition timeline, Every compost pile is a little bit different. It can take as long as two years or as short as 14 days. Now, in my personal experience, I have never been able to turn a compost pile as quickly in 14 days. I've never been able to do that. Maybe if you're really skilled and you've been doing it for decades and you really have it down to a science, you can maybe get it down to 14 days, but typically four to six months is about average for breaking down that pile um, down to when it's ready to put in your garden. And it kind of depends on the content and how often you turn it. Um, you may have to water your compost pile if you've had no rain. And one way to accelerate decomposition is to mix it often. And then also once you've mixed it, you kind of build up those layers again. Um, and fungus and other microorganisms will begin to break down those materials and the pile should shrink. Once you've begun your compost pile, it should start to shrink within two to three weeks. And by the time the compost is done, it will shrink by half or even down to a fourth of its original size. Okay, next. So there are all different kinds of compost piles. You can spend as much or as little as you want on it. Um, for folks who live in an urban environment and don't necessarily have a yard, to start a pile, you can do it indoors with kitchen scraps and some leaves or grass clippings. Um, I've personally never done that, but I know people who have. And then um, that picture in the, in the center is layers of straw and soil and kitchen scraps. It looks like they have like a wire. They created like a casing or like a fencing around it. Um, that's probably the, most inexpensive way to do it or the cheapest is just literally just creating like a pile <laughs> that doesn't cost any money um and then that picture on the top right that little bucket that's something to to that you can use to create something called compost tea there's a little spigot on the bottom and when you drain the water on the bottom of your compost pile it's brown and liquidy and it doesn't necessarily smell great. It's called compost tea and you can add that directly to your vegetable plants and it's an excellent fertilizer. And then the bottom left, folks can, you can fill your compost piles out of pallets. Um, if you choose to create a compost bins with pallets, make sure you're using pallets that have not been treated. 
uh, like a, it usually it can, it says on the side if it's treated or not, or if it has like a green tint to it, you know that wood's been treated. And essentially it's filled with heavy metals like arsenic and it probably has pesticides in it and all those things that you don't necessarily want to put back in your garden. So if you're choosing to create them out of pallets, make sure it's untreated wood. And then in that bottom middle, that's a compost barrel. So you put your materials in, you close it up and it has a handle and you can turn it. It's really fun. And then the bottom right, I've also seen them made out of like plastic. Okay, next. So if your compost pile starts to smell, these are two things that could be happening. One, it could go into anaerobic respiration, which means there's no oxygen in your pile. And a lot of times that happens because it's too wet. So one thing to solve that problem is you turn your pile, add leaves to your compost pile or straw, and that helps add some ground materials. So probably you have to, you're too heavy on nitrogen and you wanna add more carbon. You can add leaves, straw, stuff like that, kind of aerate it and kind of bring it back to life. And if it's not composting, it's too dry, um, you can add more nitrogen, which is like food scraps and grass clippings, and then add water and then turn it. And that will help it decompose faster. Okay, next. So these are the do's and don'ts of your compost pile. So these are the things you can add. Fruit and veg scraps, coffee grounds, eggshells, you can add mold or stale bread, cardboard, shredded paper, paper towels, grass clippings, dried leaves, and chicken manure, uh, things like that. So don't compost. You don't wanna compost meat or dairy products, fat or grease, bones, or any diseased plants or chemicals as well. Okay, next. So now let's talk a little bit about irrigation. There's lots of different styles of irrigation for vegetable gardens. You could do rain barrels, which is a water catchment system off of a roof and it drains into a rain barrel. And then you can attach a hose to that and you can essentially water your garden for free. Um, drip irrigation, which is a style of irrigating that can cost money up front, but it essentially gets water right to where the vegetable plant is, but nowhere else. So one, you're saving money on water because you're only watering your vegetables and you're not watering weeds. Um, and it does keep weed pressure down too. So I prefer drip irrigation system, but it does cost some money up front to install that. Hand watering, that's just with a hose and a watering wand. Um, sprinklers, soaker hoses, and trenching. And you want to keep in mind what are the most critical times to water your vegetables to create to to get delicious vegetables. For coal crops, it's during your development head. So when you're on your broccoli and cabbage, when they're starting to develop the head, you want to make sure it's con getting consistent watering. With your root crops, um, when it's developing the the en enlargement of the roots. So when the beets are starting to enlarge their roots, the radishes, the carrots. For sweet corn, when the corn is tasseling and is starting to develop its ears, you wanna make sure it's getting consistent watering. Cucumbers, peppers, melons, tomatoes, really once it starts flowering until fruit development, um, you wanna make sure it's getting consistent water. With onions, when it's developing the bulb and with potatoes, when tuber initiation and development begins. Okay, next. So intercropping, that's a style of garden design where you're planting multiple plants species together in the same bed. And usually you're pairing short season vegetables with long season vegetables. So for example, radishes have a from seed to harvest is approximately 40 days. So we consider that a short season vegetable. You can plant that right beside tomatoes, which from, um, yes, transplant, that's not seed. So from transplant to harvest, tomatoes are approximately 80 days. 
So you can plant radishes in amongst your tomatoes. And by the time the radishes are ready to be harvested, the tomatoes are leafing out and um, producing fruits. So it really maximizes the space because you're getting two crops within a, a small space. Um, also, it can help with pests because there are certain vegetables that can uh, create like a resistance to certain pests and it can be beneficial to its surrounding area. It also helps with weed suppression because that all that soil is being shaded and so just keeping weeds down. And then also you have a larger yield because you're producing two crops in the same space. So if you're just growing tomatoes, you're also getting radishes in addition. So you're gonna just grow more food. Okay, next. So companion planting is a type of intercropping for a purpose, essentially to combat pest pressure, to improve, improve growth, vigor, and flavor enhancement. So a very common example of companion planting is something called the three sisters, which is squash, beans, and corn. And the idea is, is that the squash grows on the ground, it's a vining crop, and it shades out any weeds. And then the beans grow up the stalk of the corn. So it's a symbiotic relationship. They all benefit from one another. And it's, it's a very common practice within the Native American community. But there's all different types of companion planting. So for tomatoes, for example, we often will grow basil with tomatoes or marigolds. And that's because their scent will deter pests. And so often you'll see them grown together. Or carrots, you can also grow those besides tomatoes. So lots of different examples. You can see them online. This is just a few of them. But there are a lot of vegetables you can grow right beside each other to maximize space, but also to deter pests. Okay, next. So square foot gardening is also a garden design where you maximize space in raised beds. And as you can see in this picture, essentially you create a one foot by one foot square grid and it helps you get multiple crops within one raised bed. Okay, next. So as you can see in this picture, you develop a grid of one foot or 12 inches by 12 inches and then you design it based on the spacing of each plant that's needed. So plants that require six inch spacing, you could put four plants within one square. If they need four inch spacing, you could put nine plants within each square. And if they require three inch spacing, you can put up to 16 plants per square. Okay, next. So this is on a larger scale um, for, you can do this raised beds or in ground. Um, but this helps you kind of plan out your garden with those one inch squares. As you can see, some plants like pumpkins, they need a much larger space. But with corn on the top left, they only need um, one, one foot square per plant. And there's lots of examples of this online if you need help. There's also tools online to help design and plan out your garden. Next. Okay, so that covers it for me. Um, I see we have a question in the chat box. One is the visual planting charts are so helpful. Oh, thank you, Christy. <laughs> we can also have this available online um, if you wanna see those charts. So what questions do you guys have for us? Can you tell me why the onions were by the strawberries in that last one? Um, can you go back? Oh, because onions hardly take up any room at all. So you can, whereas strawberries, they're a, they, they send out runners. So they like to take up some space. So I think it's just a way to maximize the space. Do you and, think those are good companion plants yes. then? And it wouldn't affect the taste of the strawberry or anything? No, it will not affect the taste of the strawberries whatsoever. Yes, those are Do you those think it's... Well. Does the onion also protect the strawberry from pests possibly? Yes, it can or be not. a parent, yes. Awesome. Yeah, and it, will not, it won't make the strawberries taste onion at all, yeah. <laughs> and the spacing of it works really well because onions don't take up much space and strawberries do. Yeah. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, about the freeze dates that Britt, you were going over earlier, I think. Um, I'm in a different zone than you guys. I'm up in North Georgia. But um, any suggestions on, because I do agree, <laughs> I feel like the temperatures are shifting, like how to best judge maybe a freeze date in general, like when you do see the fluctuations, like we have maybe colder temperatures than we've had most of the winter coming this coming week. Like it's a better way or another way to help judge freeze dates in your area, I guess. Um, well, your local extension service is probably going to have, they probably will be tracking weather patterns much, much more so than like we are in our area. Um, also kind of always keep an eye on the 10 day forecast. So for me, I live in the Kent, South Kansas City area and I've been tracking the weather a lot and I have been holding off on planting my spring vegetables because it's getting down to like 17 at night and even cool season crops can't handle 17 degrees. Really the only, probably about 25 degrees, I think is about anything below that, they're not gonna do well. So I've been keeping a very close eye on the weather. Um, so that would be my suggestion. And then your local extension service would probably have even more accurate like weather patterns in your area. And they can give you some advice on that. What uh, zone are you in? I have to look again. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm in the beginner class, not the intermediate, but I still enjoy watching. <laughs> Lots of great info. Nice presentation, ladies. Thank you. Any other questions? I just reminded myself how to unmute. <laughs> I don't use Zoom often. Um, hi, I'm Misty. Um, I was going to ask, um, and it, I have a small greenhouse outside, but it's, it's still new to me using that, but it's not heated and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I've been starting some of my seeds inside, but I've been really leery <laughs> about taking things into the greenhouse because I really don't know without running out there, you know, at three or four o'clock in the morning to see the temperature. Um, and I haven't done that yet. But um, like you, I'm on the other side of the state. So I'm south of St. Louis and we're getting ready to hit some really low temperatures. And I have my tomatoes started on the inside and I'm thinking probably not even put them in the greenhouse then just leave them inside for now. Yeah, I don't think your tomatoes are ready to okay. go outside <laughs> quite yet because the night temperatures <laughs> in our area, I'm not quite sure what it is in St. Louis, but in our area it's getting down to like teens. Yeah, and, we're supposed um, to also. <laughs> yeah, and tomatoes just can't handle that. Really anything below 50 degrees okay. is really going to yeah. stop them. <laughs> for the rest of its life. So I would say try to avoid that as much as possible. So once we start to get more consistent, warmer temperatures in the spring, you can probably start putting them out in the greenhouse, but you wanna do it slowly. You don't want to put them out there permanently. I would say the first day, put them out there for okay. maybe two hours. And then the next day, you know, three or five hours. And then, so kind of gradually work them up to that because also mm -hmm. it's gonna be getting full sun is going to be getting more you know mm -hmm. light and so it needs to adjust to not just the temperatures but also the intensity of the light gotcha. um, so yeah so just kind of gradually adjusting to the greenhouse and then also once you put it out in the greenhouse you also need to gradually adjust it to the outdoors because it's going to be getting winds mm -hmm. and yeah. it's going to be different than even your greenhouse so again you need to transition it outside so okay for about a week before you're ready to plant them outside every day. So the first day, put them out for about two hours outside, next day, three or five hours, next day, six hours, eight hours, mm -hmm. you know, until the last day, put them out for maybe a full 10, 10 12 yeah. hours, and then they'll be ready to plant. 
Okay. Yeah. It's a good idea. Um, I was going to also ask about like the cold weather uh, planting and things like that, because <laughs> I'm like, I feel like I'm behind again, although I had intended to be on time. Um, <laughs> uh, that's why I started the tomatoes as early as I did, because I want them to be really nice and healthy before they go in the garden this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but as far as like broccoli and kale and collards and all of those things, starting my seed, I can do those, um, like starting those inside and also, or do I just go ahead and start those in the greenhouse or start them in the ground? Because you again, know, with the temperatures right now, I'm like, oh, yeah. So for cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, I would, because at this point, in the Kansas City area, you can plant those March 20th. So as transplants. So oh. I would suggest <laughs> planting, <laughs> like buying the plants mm. and planting those in your garden soon. Like March yeah. 20th is Kansas City area. Okay. Um, they like the cooler temperatures, mm -hmm. um, but anything below 25 can shock them. Yeah. and potentially kill them. So you can put something to protect them, like um, frost cover. It's like a blanket that mm -hmm. you can buy and you can cover your raised bed or your in-ground bed, whatever, whichever you have, and you can mm -hmm. cover that and protect it for those nighttime temperatures. Um, so that's what some people do. They get them in the ground early and then they just cover them at night to help protect them for those decreasing So if I was going to start some of these in the fall, I would start them in like around July, August, like that in like in either in the greenhouse or inside, and then I can transplant them as they get it gets yes. colder. Yeah, That's no, fun. so for cool season vegetables, they like the soil to be cool, to, to be cold mm -hmm. when it's otherwise it won't germinate. If the soil temperature is too hot, mm -hmm. your cool season vegetables will not germinate. So I don't think you should probably start those in your greenhouse because you're most likely your greenhouse unless it's air conditioned, it probably won't be cool enough. Yeah. So maybe put it in a downstairs basement area somewhere where it's a little bit cooler um, to start those. Yeah. Now cool. tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, they love it hot. That yes, you know, like in the but, sunny window. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, um, if you think of any more questions later on, um, feel free to email us. Um, my email is mbarain, so that's M. B A U R A I N at biggarden.org. You could also find our contact information um, on the Big Garden website. And then Brittany's is Brittany, you want to tell everybody what your email is? Uh, my email is B Byer, so B E Y E R at biggarden.org. Yeah. So if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you, ladies. Okay. Great thank presentation. You. Thank you.